دكتور أسامة شكرا دكتور لويس على هذه الجلسة الشاملة يتطلب خلق بيئات ممكنة مجتمعات خلق بيئات ممكنة سياسات شاملة تشجع التعاون بين مختلف الجهات المعنية بما في ذلك الحكومات والمؤسسات التعليمية والقطاع الخاص من خلال تعزيز الشراكات يمكن لهذه السياسات أن تعزز الابتكار مما يسهم في تطوير حلول تعالج التحديات التي تواجه التعليم لاستكشاف هذا الموضوع نرحب بجلسة النقاش التالية التي تديرها دكتور فانينا تورلو قائد التعليم في منطقة الشرق الأوسط وشمال إفريقيا في اي واي بي عنوان الجلسة هو البيئات الداعمة لسياسات تعزز الشراكات ودعم الابتكار Thank you Dr. Osama and Dr. Lewis for a comprehensive session. Creating enabling environments requires comprehensive policies that encourage collaboration among diverse stakeholders, including governmental, ed governments, educational institutions, and the private sector. By fostering partnerships, these policies can drive innovation, facilitating the development of solutions that address the unique challenges faced in education. To find out, We welcome the next discussion panel moderated by Dr. Vanina Torlo, market leader at Ernst Dank Parthenon for the MENA region. The title of the panel is Creating Enabling Environment Policies that Foster Partnerships and Innovation. Dr. Torlo, you may start. Thank you very much. Good evening. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, everyone. And thank you very much for attending this very fascinating session. As anticipating, as anticipated, today we are going to discuss the increasingly important role of partnership in education and how to best leverage policies to enable successful partnership. Very important topic. So a quick teaser to introduce the session, uh, which is about the fact that today, as educators, as parents, as consultants even, We well know that all over the world and in the, in the region in particular, there is an increasing number of partnerships in education, spanning academic partnership, partnership with the government or with the private sector. But the, there are some very important questions that it's worth discussing, which is why are partnership becoming so critical uh, and especially in the region? and why uh, many of them actually fail and only some succeed. And what are the policies that can actually enable them and ensure uh, they being successful? So as anticipated, I'm Vanina Torlo, uh, head of the education practice in EYP with over 15 years of experience in education as strategic consultant, but also as academic. And I'm really honored to be here today to address these important questions by moderating a truly extraordinary panel composed by Her Excellency Nesreen Baraka, who is the CEO of the Jordan Forum, uh, the, the Jordan Strategy Forum, and prominent figure known for a leadership in both public service and private sector development. Well, with over 25 years of experience, she has already deeply contributed to the economic and social development of Jordan, serving as Minister of Social Development, but also as Minister of Public Sector Development. Then we have Mrs. Alor Malaza, partner at Bain Company, leader of the social impact practice across Europe, Middle East and, and Africa. She's widely recognized for her expertise in driving education programs across the GCC, notably for early childhood education, and also worth mentioning her personal and special interest in diversity, equity, and inclusion, uh, very important themes in general, and in particular when it comes to education. We also have Dr. Harry Patrinos, head of the Department of Education Reform, and 21st Century Endow Chair in Education Policy at the University of Arkansas. Um, he has extensive experience in the economics of education, particularly when it comes to the public and private partnerships um, that he has acquired through his current role, but also as former advisor for education at the World Bank. Last but not least, we have Ms. Uh, Mukayo Azamova, who is an accomplished educator and advocate for educational reform, um, particularly known for her innovative approaches 
to enhancing the quality of education in her community. She's very dedicated to promoting access to quality education and inclusivity, particularly for underprivileged or marginalized groups. And she's very recognized uh, with a national medal for her contribution to the education system in Uzbekistan, uh, especially during her collaboration for the, with the country's Ministry of Education. Now, some setting some ground rules for this session. Throughout our discussion, I hope to delve into the key points uh, through some moderated Q&As, and I'm really eager to hear the diverse perspectives from our panelists, as well as to welcome questions from our audience online towards the end. Shall we? Um, so let me start uh, with you, uh, Your Excellency, um, to uh, ask you to share your view on the role of partnerships in education uh, in general, but also in particular with reference to the role of the private sector in enabling them. Your Excellency, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Vanina, for your kind introduction. It gives me a great pleasure to be among such a distinguished group of panelists. And also, uh, I'm really honored to speak at the QRT, a prominent uh, annual forum. Uh, to be honest, we cannot work in silos. Partnerships between all stakeholders are critically needed to achieve our development goals, and one of uh, which is the education. So partnerships in education are really necessary in the region as they bring together various stakeholders, including government, private sector, uh, nonprofit organizations, communities, communities to enhance educational outcomes. These collaboration can address effectively education common challenges, as well as improve access to quality education and foster innovation. Actually, Impact assessment studies tell, uh, tell us that schools engaged in partnership often see better student outcome, more uh, professional development opportunities for teachers, better utilization of resources and reduction of costs, as well as uh, accessibility and equity to schooling, especially in low income areas. And we see that globally, private sector role is very crucial as well. It contributed over 8 billion to educational initiatives in 2020. Also, EdTech investments reached 16.3 uh, uh, billion in 2021. If we zoom into Jordan, public-private partnerships have become a key strategy for addressing challenges in the education sector, including limited uh, public resources, uh, growing student uh, population, as well as integration of uh, refugee children, as, as you know. The collaboration goes back to uh, more than 20 years ago, when initiatives uh, like the Jordan Education Initiative, in partnership with the private sector and UNESCO, was introduced to advance technologies, improve accessibility, and enhance teacher training. Today, further partnerships were formed and sustained. Among these, I would like to mention Madrasati Initiative, which was launched in 2008 to serve Jordanian public uh, schools identified in the most underperforming and uh, most in need of renovation. It has 140 partners from public, private, and civil society sectors. Madrasati was able to reach more than 600, uh, 360,000 students, seven, more than 17,000 teachers, and uh, 800 volunteers across the 12 governorates of Jordan. That was done in collaboration with the private sector, including banks, telecommunication companies, among others. Also, I would like actually uh, to mention Queen Rania Teacher Academy. It's another initiative that was launched to enhance teacher training in Jordan. Since 2009, QRTA has provided professional development to over uh, 80,000 educators and in service training programs reaching more than 50,000 teachers. 
Moreover, we shouldn't forget that the private education accommodate more than 24% of the student population in Jordan. Easing the burden on the public uh, schools, it plays also a key role at the KG level, serving almost 60% of the students. And if I, if you allow me to zoom in more, talking about JSF, Jordan Strategy Forum, as a think tank uh, entity and policy advocacy platform that was established by the private sector, JSF places education and labor market among its four top research priorities. We aim at JSF to improve Jordan education system, uh, align uh, its outcome with the workforce needs, and also drive sustainable development of Jordan. We continuously uh, evaluate at JSF the performance of the sector to identify the gaps and challenges and demand uh, that demand innovative solutions. And also, we encourage public-private partnerships to address these challenges. Our work provides actually policymakers with evidence-based recommendations that underscore the necessity of these partnerships. In this context, uh, uh, we played an integral uh, role in drafting Jordan Economic Modernization Vision uh, 2033 and also the Public Sector Modernization Roadmap. Both uh, roadmaps focused on the education sector as a strong enabler for Jordan economic growth. So as you can see, uh, whether globally uh, at the level of Jordan or uh, as uh, at the level of institutions that work with them all, uh, partnership for us is a, is a key when it comes to education. Thank you. Thank you so much, Your Excellency. It's amazing uh, to have your uh, overview across uh, different areas of partnerships across different entities, providing some interesting examples and uh, and also figures of the results that we can obtain through uh, partnerships. So really, really thank you for that. You also touched upon uh, the, the important topic of uh, the labor market. Uh, so I, I come to you, uh, Anlor, because I know this is a topic that is particularly close to, to your heart. So uh, from your vantage point in the GCC, if you uh, do you mind giving us a bit of your point of view, first in general about the types of partnerships that you see in the region, and also about the role uh, of partnership in, in improving the famous skills mismatch to enhance students' employability or more in general, their career opportunities. Thank you so much, uh, Vanina and uh, Dr. Osama and team for having me. I'm honored to be here. I think when I saw the question, the first question I asked myself is what type of partnership are we talking about? Because there's so many. Um, so I think, as you said, a few types come to mind. Private sector is, is definitely something critical, and I'll go into it in a bit more depth. But other things that came to my mind were partnerships with the community, partnership with parents, with the home. We all have seen the studies done by OECD that show that, you know, when parents are engaged and they have a connection with the schools, PISA score are higher uh, than when, when they're not, right? I think the latest figure was 10% in 2022. We also have inter-school partnerships or schools and university often focused on teacher development and professional development. And of course, the most well-known are the academic partnerships, which we tend to see a lot in the GCC, such as, for example, um, you know, all the work that's been done by the foundation, the Qatar Foundation in Qatar to bring Georgetown, Carnegie Mellon and other universities, NYU Abu Dhabi and Abu Dhabi and, and other examples you see in other countries of the GCC. One interesting point maybe on those academic partnerships is we've started to see a shift in the region towards Asia as well. We traditionally in the region had a big focus on partnering with organizations in the West, but we're seeing a lot more diversity with, for example, the announcement of the IIT opening in Abu Dhabi just a couple of months ago, and more diversity in terms of the range of partnerships. And part of the reason for that is because, you know, countries in the region want to shape their own models, and they're starting to look at different models to pick and choose what seems to be the most interesting and craft something that is coherent with our values and cultures in the region. So a lot of different uh, partnerships come to mind, all of them critical to enhancing opportunities for students, 
for teachers, um, improving outcomes in many cases, and supporting holistic development of students. Maybe if we spend a minute on the industry and the private sector one, because that, that one is, is quite exciting, and we're seeing big shifts happening in that space. If you look at 10, 15 years ago, the life shelf of skills used to be 15 years on average, or sorry, six years on average, 15 years ago. Today, we're talking about a life shelf of skills that is between 12 to 18 months, especially in sectors that are very technology uh, disrupted, right? So you have a very different world than we used to 15 years ago, where you would study and things would stay for a while without you needing to maybe refresh your skills as often. What's happened is career connectedness and connectedness between employers potentially and the school system, the university system in that context have become much more critical. So what we're seeing is a rise of partnerships with the industry across all levels of your learning life cycle. You start in early childhood with private sector and nonprofit organizations sponsoring, for example, extracurricular activities all the way into high school where you have partnerships in, in the region here. We've seen some in the UAE, for example, where the private sector partners to add elements to the curriculum that we think will be beneficial from a skills perspective. And we're starting to see a shift both in high school and in university uh, more recently. You will see some hopefully regulatory shifts happen soon because there are many discussions on that in Saudi and the UAE around on the job training starting very, very early. So having high schoolers actually do internships, spend time uh, to, to, you know, to learn more about the skills required in the careers and then be able to prepare for them earlier on so you don't have the mismatch which we've been talking about uh, today. So, I see a lot of promise in that uh, space of the industry to university, industry to high school uh, opportunities. We're seeing the market shifting from a supply driven model to a demand driven model. And we're starting to see that happening earlier and earlier on in the school life cycle. So it's very exciting to see you know, the differences that this will bring to the table. Thank you, thank you so much, and Laura. Uh, so much to uh, so much as insights, no, like different types of partnership, all very different ways, but very impactful across levels of uh, education. I love the fact that you started with uh, early childhood education to to finish with the university because it's really across all levels. Uh, so I guess we have established the fact that uh, partnerships are really, really needed for uh, to to ensure. Uh, quality education. Um, yet, reality is that it's not easy for partnership to be successful. In fact, many of them fail, uh, and only some succeed. So, uh, on this topic, maybe Dr. Patrinos, if I may come to you to ask your view about, uh, given your experience, especially when it comes to the collaboration between the public and private sector, so what are the uh, key lessons? you've learned in designing effective uh, PPPs uh, in education. And it would be great if you could mention for us some of the good practices, but also maybe the mistakes to not make in order to avoid failure. Thank you. You're, you're absolutely correct. The design is key for ensuring success for effectiveness and, and sustainability. Um, partnerships in education can be transformative if they're designed with clear goals and structures. One of the key lessons is that these partnerships have to encourage innovation. How do you do that? You allow schools to partner in autonomy over the use of their resources, personnel, curriculum, and so on. And we see this in, in high performing. For example, all the funding is, is public, most of the provision is by non state actors, but all acting uh, towards the public goals. However, with autonomy, uh, you have to have accountability, and that will ensure that schools are responsible for, for their outcomes or for their partnership agreement. And this can be seen through performance evaluations and transparency in the in the results. 
going back to the case of the Netherlands, many of the um, Many I'm really them. sorry to, to interrupt you, Dr. Patrinos, but from the audience, I think there, uh, there are problems in hearing you properly. You know, if you could possibly be closer maybe to your mic. I, I will try. I, I don't have a, a separate mic. I hope this is a little bit better. It's I'll better. I think it's better already. Thank you. Okay. Um, I'll try to speak louder. So I was saying that um, Autonomy has to come with uh, with accountability and transparency, and we see this in, in high performing countries like the Netherlands, where much of the provision is done by non state actors. But the accountability is ensured through performance evaluations and publishing of the results and making them transparent and open to to everyone. Another critical element is to empower parents and students. So the ultimate beneficiaries of these programs uh, need to be involved, and they're clearly involved, but involved also in the design of the, the programs, giving them diverse options that perhaps they wouldn't have received through purely traditional public uh, provision, and that the opportunities are not limited by their wealth or ability. Therefore, we are promoting, therefore, equity in access and hopefully outcomes. Governments can foster these, can foster this by enabling different providers, diverse providers to enter the, uh, the education space to encourage some level of competition and therefore better outcomes. Successful public-private partnerships shift the role of government from being solely uh, being a uh, provider to a financier and steward of the system, making sure that resources are used efficiently while the non-state actors deliver innovative solutions. Where we see these partnerships fail has to do with the design. And I'll mention a few elements of design, not taking into account the supply. So you can encourage competition and diversity, but if you don't have the, the partners, you won't really improve the uh, outcome. So being clear about who is available and what they can do is uh, um, not having clear goals, not having alignment between, say, government and the uh, private sector, that also limits the effect of, of, of partnerships. So you need to be clear. What what are you trying to achieve? Is it test scores? Is it access to uh, secondary education? Is it access to the labor market? And those goals need to be announced, measured, and you need to have the the evaluation. And a uh, final critical element is the timing of the programs. It takes a long time. I think that the previous speaker already alluded to this. It takes a long time to build the relationships and trust in the system. And so we do need good planning for the partnerships. And the final thing I will say is uh, we need rigorous impact evaluation in order to judge and assess the programs. First, to see if they're doing what they're supposed to do, where they're achieving the outcomes. And the winner, we need to be able to jump leaked, maybe completely overhauled, or maybe it just didn't work. Maybe it was a good idea and it didn't work. Let's do something else. Let's not keep doing something for the sake of the partnership, but uh, base those decisions on data and evidence and actual uh, you can also help identify what works and for which groups of students. The things will work for different. Uh, and this will allow for constant learning and improvements in the partnership model. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, Mrs. Muyako, for, for you, uh, I guess we know about some uh, important successful cases from the Ministry of Education in Uzbekistan that you've been uh, 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 an important contributor to that. So are you aligned with this type of uh, success factors that Dr. Patrinos is uh, describing for us and what has been this successful experience uh, from your point of view? 
Well, uh, thank you, Dr. Torlo. Exactly to the point of Professor um, Patrinos, international institutions and scholars basically all agree that for partnership to be truly successful, we must to have equal trilateral partnership on national, international and local levels. Like this balanced approach ensures that um, Global best practices are implemented in the ways that are sensitive to local needs, while national governments provide necessary framework and policies. Well, in case of Uzbekistan, this model was followed to the nail uh, when we opened up to international cooperation and reforms. And one of the first uh, areas to benefit was, of course, education sector. We were lucky at that time to obtain the largest uh, grant from international partner, which gave us chance to improve our textbooks. And the teachers who we essentially see as grassroots experts, they were the first to feel the impact of this dynamic change. Before the reforms, Uzbekistan's uh, English um, language education faced numerous challenges. For example, the textbooks that were developed years ago, um, you know, locally, uh, they were fragmented and poorly structured. For some reason, first graders were exp were not taught how to read and write at all, while second graders all of a sudden were expected to work on grammar exercises. And the textbook itself was filled with uh, mistakes and uh, visually confusing layouts while um, like uh, some cultural international elements like uh, Christmas trees, holidays and other markers were absent altogether. So this time with the help of these international grants, um, the Ministry of Education had opportunity to engage international experts and utilize Cambridge textbooks. In turn, the international international partners, international experts worked with our teachers all over the country. This way, we ensured that our local experts, the most valuable experts, teachers, played a central role in setting the reforms. And um, national policymakers this time basically uh, joined forces with teachers to adapt Cambridge textbooks uh, to make sure that it fit our Uzbek culture and our values. Uh, most importantly, thanks to this coherent trilateral partnership on national, international and local levels, Uzbekistan avoided developing English language textbooks this time. Learning from past experience when relying on local efforts only had fallen short. Instead, this time we chose to leverage internationally recognized curriculum. And um, this uh, experience, which I consider success, um, a success story, so to say, shows that following this model of balanced trilateral partnership supported by complementary policy level programs and legislation can create impactful reforms, basically. That's it. Thank you so much. Thank you. This is, uh, this is a very important, very um, crucial because we all know that, you know, it's not just enough uh, to design partnership effectively as we are suggesting so far but there is now uh, uh, an, an element of uh, allowing the policies to to make this partnership flourish and being successful over time which is equally important because otherwise these partnerships many times get delayed or find along the way many obstacles that make them either uh, not successful or not sustainable over time. So on, on this topic of the importance of uh, policies, of the policy making level, being it in designing reforms, in re designing or redesigning regulations, uh, thinking about possible incentives, what can we do to uh, design policies at these different levels to enable successful partnerships? Uh, what's your point of view on this, uh, uh, Your Excellency? Thank you, Vanina, again. Uh, I think uh, the points that were raised uh, uh, from my colleagues and uh, Dr. Patrius uh, actually paved the way for this question. It's a very sure. critical question, how to ensure successful and sustainable partnerships in education. Uh, we we need to have a comprehensive approach to, uh, to policy developments in in my view 
Uh, for example, if we take uh, Jordan, in the coming three years, the United Nations has allocated uh, almost 75% of its support to Jordan for implementing sustainable development goals uh, targeted uh, specifically to the improvement of SDG 4, which is the quality of education. This funding underscores uh, the need uh, for targeted policies that foster collaboration between public and private entities, among other civil society, community organizations, and other. And while developing the uh, policy uh, frameworks, we need uh, to take into consideration uh, several factors that will avoid us from uh, getting into a failure experience. Among these factors, uh, I believe we need to have clear policy framework for the partnership in education. Establishing an, uh, trans a transparent policy framework is essential for guiding a uh, public-private partnership in education. A well-defined framework will ensure accountability and compliance. Uh, it will also create a stable foundation for collaborative efforts. Also, uh, strong belief and confidence in the private sector. Usually, we, we say that we want to partner, but not necessarily strongly we believe in that. So the private sector, we know that today is, is willing more than ever and is keen to be socially responsible. It reports annually on its social initiatives as part of its ESG reporting. So creating an appealing and guided ecosystem for PPPs, in, uh, including incentives, as you mentioned, Venina, is crucial to foster greater collaboration. Uh, moreover, stakeholder engagement. This point, uh, Dr. Patrios has touched upon it. Engaging all stakeholders, including educators, partners, students, uh, community, as was mentioned uh, uh, by uh, Anna uh, Lord, uh, members in the uh, in the design and planning stage is also vital. This input ensures that uh, partnerships address community needs effectively, leading to more relevant and impactful education reforms. But again, monitoring and evaluation mechanisms are uh, very much needed. Uh, developing robust systems uh, to monitor and evaluate partnerships helps assess their impact and ident identify areas for improvement. So regular evaluation to ensure that partnerships remain aligned with educational objectives and community needs is very much needed. Also, we need to think about capacity building, investing in capacity building programs for both public and private partners uh, to enhance their ability to collaborate effectively. Uh, financial sustainability is very much needed. Uh, implementing policies that promote the financial sustainability of such partnerships is crucial. Uh, this would include establishing viable funding models and ensuring that partnerships can attract private investment uh, and reducing the financial burden uh, to reduce the financial burden uh, on the government. But uh, most importantly, we need to align with the national education goals while we are uh, forming these uh, uh, policies. Uh, initiatives uh, should be uh, going hand in hand with the na national education strategies and, goal, uh, and goals to promote co uh, coherence um, and direction. Uh, most importantly, these efforts must, must uh, ally in the case, uh, for example, of Jordan uh, with the uh, uh, recently adopted uh, economic modernization uh, vision, which places significant emphasis on the education as a cornerstone for Jordan's future development. So finally, I believe that integrating these necessary uh, factors within the policies uh, we can establish in enduring and impactful partnerships uh, that advance our education system and support national development goals. Thank you so much, Your Excellency. You, you touched upon uh, uh, so many important cases, but uh, what I'm very uh, pleased to see is the emphasis that every panelist is putting on this key word that is alignment when it comes to partnerships 
uh, and that's one of the reasons why we, we, we discussed this before, some of them fail, uh, is the misalignment of uh, objectives, of vision, of uh, uh, alignment with the vision itself for, for education in a specific country. So raising this important aspect of alignment at the level of the policy making, as you are suggesting, Her Excellency, I think is uh, uh, particularly important because uh, alignment is such a, a key ingredient of uh, successful partnerships, especially to make them sustainable over time. Um, and also, well, then I, I, since you mentioned also you touched upon uh, uh, PPPs, uh, again, when it comes to uh, policy making, uh, I, I come to you again, Dr. Patrinos, uh, you are a bit the, the specialist here in PPPs, uh, to deep dive even more uh, when it comes to PPPs on your point of view on the policies needed. Uh, or how we should shape new policies in order to enable more successful PPPs in the region. I, mean, uh, I think uh, Her Excellency summarized it very well. So what, what I'll do is maybe add, add a couple of examples, because I think we both agree on, on the, the, sure. the main points, on the uh, clear and legal regulatory frameworks, I agree these are crucial. One thing that that might mean is how do you ensure the entry of the right uh, of the right partners? So if the educational needs were uh, lack of supply in rural areas, then encouraging more providers into urban areas isn't really going to solve your problem. So th that's where you know, innovative and smart education policy uh, comes in. So how do, how do governments, for example, bring in the incentives that will encourage those, those partners to go to underserved areas? Uh, we have an example of uh, Colombia. Um, years ago in, in Bogota, they, they had a program where they brought the least performing private schools, which at that time were focused on um, urban uh, wealthy areas, and they invited them to provide education to low-income uh, areas uh, in, in the city, capital city of Bogota. That worked very well. It's been evaluated. Um, and then the program was, was brought to rural areas with the encouragement of, of the government and some financial incentives to, to make that possible. So it is possible to bring providers from the um, relatively uh, well-off areas to uh, more disadvantaged areas. Uh, the, other, the other area I would uh, touch upon is on the, uh, on the contract itself, the agreement that whatever you want to call that partnership relationship. Um, I think it works best with a contract and that contract not only should you know, establish the partnership and the goals, but also an exit strategy for government. Again, it could have been a, a great idea that that uh, a group of people had to to try. Maybe it didn't work for whatever reason. There's no need to continue to uh, and resources on something that doesn't work. Uh, you need to move on. And so I'll go back to the case of Bogota, Colombia. The contract had an exit clause. If the schools didn't achieve a certain level of uh, test scores, then the government would end that uh, would end that agreement. So having the exit clause, I think, is very important, and it's a reason why maybe the, the, the relationship. I know we want to establish trust and and uh, uh, and, and sustainability, but uh, we do need uh, something legal, as it were. So a contract seems to work best. Implied contracts are great. Um, better to have it written. Uh, the the other area we we'll talk about is uh, the costs. Uh, is these need to be Assess something may be may be great. It works small scale, but can we afford to to bring this to national scale? So can we try to find ways to reduce the cost to make it more uh, effective? And therefore, you have sustainability, and that might might require uh, adjustments to the program or bringing in more uh, more partners. And finally, we do need the the part of the system, the one off. Ideas are, are are fine, but if you really want to transform the education system, we need to think about 
uh, building those systems. Uh, or as you mentioned, the uh, capacity building, I think that needs to be built into the partnerships on having a level of sharing. Something might work very well uh, in a few schools, but can we find ways to, to scale it and bring it maybe to the public sector? So sharing knowledge across sectors. And finally, the effective uh, policies should should ensure some kind of continuous learning loop where both public and private are sharing out insights, improving outcomes, as, as we've seen in successful models in, in Colombia that I mentioned. Also, we see this in more challenging environments like in Pakistan. Thank you. Very clear, very clear. Uh, just conscious of time, I come to you, uh, Mukayo, uh, uh, to ask you whether you want to shed light on some Key lessons from your experience uh, in, with Pakistan from a policy point of view? Uh, yes, uh, I have a couple of examples and exactly to the point of Dr. Patrinas. Um, it's also, uh, I feel, very difficult to sustain positive change if proper policy level interventions are not in place. Uh, in our case, this successful example of trilateral partnership was also further supported by policies that ensured sustainability. Like, uh, for example, equipping Uzbekistan with Cambridge textbooks already was a major policy level milestone for us at that level. But to sustain this momentum, we in Uzbek government introduced complementary programs. In a sense, we made sure to build a chain of legal structures around teachers to ensure that they were supported. And one of uh, such uh, programs was Teacher of the Year program. And we um, legislated bonuses and salary increases. At the same time, we kept on raising international funds outside of government budget. And with the help of those uh, additional funds that we raised, we uh, provided trainings for the teachers. So we um, provided free of charge TOEFL certificates. And of course, the nationwide response was overwhelmingly positive. Teachers across Uzbekistan found this opportunity deeply inspiring. They felt energized. They felt like their passion to work came back. And um, if we talk about measurable indicator indicators, this resulted in thousands of English teachers uh, receiving TOEFL certificates and thus increased salaries. Uh, most importantly, it positively impacted our very um, core uh, target group, which are school teach ch uh, children, school learners. Um, they we saw the increase in uh, their um, education, and um, the let's say the IELTS scores increased, uh, and also we saw how um, the admissions um, of school uh, graduates increased not only throughout the country, but throughout the world. Uzbek graduates started getting admitted to schools in uh, extremely high levels. So basically, to uh, wrap up, I would like to say that our success story not only transformed the landscape of English language education, but it set the new standards for sustainable international cooperation. And we made sure that uh, the chain of legislation complementing that regional program was in place. Um, that's it on my side. I just want thank to- you, Thank you. Maybe just, sorry, because I guess we have just a couple of minutes left. So I wanted to conclude maybe with a, with a final less, uh, uh, question for Anlor, a final one, but a very important one, uh, and quite challenging one. Let's imagine you have a magic wound and uh, and you would like to use it to, to make one policy change that could solve some of the problems and the current policies that hinder the success of the partnerships. Uh, what, what would you do? And, and uh, thank you, Vanina. I'll try to, to answer it uh, in a minute and a half or two minutes. I think the first thing I would do is look at the current policies we have, which in many of the countries in the MENA region are very restrictive actually to partnerships. So when you talk about the alignment to the vision, we have this vision to have incredible partnerships, but we don't allow hiring of international faculty, for example, in some countries. We have restrictions on how flexible partnerships can be, so you end up having very restrictive types of partnership agreements. So I think these would be the first thing I would start with. The second thing is you need policies both at the national level, the school level, and then the enabling level, and that's what we've been talking about here. At the national level, I would focus on policies that allow um, 
you know, essentially the, the incentivization of the partnerships at the school level, empowering the schools. If the schools have some flexibility to make agreements, to experiment, to test and learn, that's when you see innovation start to happen. We just did the world's best school prizes. All the winners did innovation partnerships in their school at the school level. And a lot of them were private schools because in the public schools, there were a lot more restrictions on the type of policies that were allowed to be done. And the last thing I'll say to build on Dr. Uh, Harry's point is that the agreements are critical. There are agreements that I have reviewed myself where the intellectual property with global partners still sits with the global partner, not with our local uh, governments or school partners. This is a very big risk. And as Dr. Harry said, there's no exit strategy. It's keeping forever, you know, th this dependency with some of the partnerships, which is absolutely the, against the interest of, of our, you know, community, societies and, and countries. So I would say that's a massive element to focus on is ensuring contractual agreements that enable independence and sustainability for the governments and universities that contract them. Thank you so much. So, so insightful and lore and a record time. Uh, so deeply appreciated. I guess uh, we maybe have time for one question, quick question from the audience or we do not. Okay, I see many of them in Arabic. Um, so I guess, I guess we will collect them all and we probably then take more time to answer even in writing. Uh, which can be more insightful. So for the time being, I thank you all for your time and uh, very interesting insights and for sharing your experience. Let's really, really hope that uh, we will see in reality these changes at the level of the policy and the government to uh, reforms to uh, enhance partnership for the future uh, to wish for a better access to quality education for everyone. Thank you very much.